Good morning, church. Danielle, Mark, and I Good are morning. delighted to be with you this morning. Uh, we wish you all a blessed Sabbath. Mm -hmm. We're pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Mark, will you pray for God's blessings on this morning's study? Yeah, my pleasure, Victor. Dear Jesus, uh, thank you. We're coming to the end of a of a great quarter studying the book Amen. of Hebrew. Amen. Today we're going to have a send off. Um, this idea of brotherly love. And you're going to show us and help us to learn about this subject today as we get into the text, we dig into your documents that you've outlaid for us to learn. Help us to embrace it, use it, and grow in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mark. Amen. Indeed. If you've read this, uh, this, this week's lesson and study it, you know that the memory text is found in Hebrews chapter 13 and verses 1, the very first verse. And an incredible short uh, memory verse, and yet so significant, where the Lord says through Paul, let brotherly love continue. And so the question is, what could Paul or, or the Lord be saying through Paul? If we um, unpack this particular verse, we, we understand that the Greek word for, for brotherly love, and most of you and I should know that, is Philadelphia. This is a term that describes the close bond that needs to exist between the members of the Christian church. It talks about love, a bond. Paul is urging that our love for Christian brethren be like that special warm affection that we feel for our close relatives. That's really what, it, what he's saying. Now, here's a brief overview of this week's Sabbath School lesson. And of course, I'm going to unpack a little bit chapter 13 of Hebrews. This week's lesson, which is primarily based on Hebrews chapter 13, presents and discusses the Apostle Paul's concluding admonition to, our, to, to us Christians. He tells us in verse 1, as we just read, let brotherly love continue. This is not an event, it's not a project, it's a lifestyle. Then it says, you see throughout the, the epistle of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul has affirmed that we Christians are of the household of the king of the universe. Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter 2 verses 11, that Jesus, our Redeemer, our Advocate, our Priest, is not ashamed to call each one of us brethren. is not ashamed to call us my brother and my sister. Christians are not a group of individuals who work on their salvation in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus. We're a family. We are our soul. And as such, Christ is the head of the family and I, I'm going to tell you today, we are all going to be saved together. Paul's letter to Hebrews as a whole is a word of exhortation. He said in Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verses 22, I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words. So in few words, there is an exhortation for you and for me this week. You see, while Paul encourages us to practical mutual love, he does not expect a simple emotional sentiment. He doesn't. Rather, Paul is encouraging you and I to specific actions. That is why in chapter 13 of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul provides several admonitions for his audience. And I'm going to touch on those. And so he tells us in Hebrews, Chapter 13, verses 2, do not forget to entertain strangers. For by doing, some, by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. In other words, we need to be hospitable. In verses 3 of chapter 13, Paul tells us, remember the prisoners as if chained with them. 
as if we are chained with the prisoners. And then it says, and those who are mis mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. In other words, remember those who are in prison and those who are being tortured. They may be part of the body of believers where you belong. In verses 4 of chapter 13, Paul tells us, marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. He admonishes his readers to ensure that marriage be held in honor. In verses 5 of chapter 13, he tells us, Let your conduct be without, without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In other words, keep your lives free from jealousy and the love of worldly goods or worldly wealth. In verses 17 of chapter 13, Paul tells us, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those that must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. In other words, obey leaders and submit to them. And then in verses 18 of chapter 13, Paul tells us, Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience. Paul's a leader. He's really saying, Pay for, pray for us leaders in all things desiring to live honorably. In other words, we need to be praying people and we need to pray for each other. Throughout the epistle of Hebrews, Paul repeatedly calls on his audience, and that includes all of us, you and I to encourage one another every day. So verses 13 of chapter 3 of Hebrews tells, exhort one another daily while it is called today. What is Paul saying? Today, don't wait for tomorrow. Exhort one another. He's saying, lest any of you be ardent through the deceitfulness of sin. Paul encourages us to provoke one another to love, to do good deeds, and not to neglect to meet together. And so, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, uh, we, we read, And let us consider one another in order to stir up, stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, that we are a body, as is the manner of some, by exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching, the second coming approaching. And then Paul tells us to see that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and, uh, and through it many become defiled. Verses 15 of chapter 12 of, of Hebrews tells us, Look carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness up, springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Finally, Paul yearns his audience not to follow strange teachers and teachings, but to follow the master teacher, our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this week we look at Paul's appeal to let brotherly love continue to exhort one another through love so that no one would fall short of the grace of God. We will review key elements that ensure um, we establish and maintain this brotherly love throughout the rest of the lesson today. So Danielle, how vital is hospitality? An so, element to establish and maintain brotherly love. So it's a good question. Uh, our text today, so it's the Sunday's lesson is caring for God's people, and it's really reviewing from Hebrews. We start with Hebrews, but then we have a few texts supporting the message from Hebrews. And Victor's already covered the text, but we'll review it again so that we can look at it carefully. Hebrews 13, 1 to 3. So let's read it. It says, let brotherly love continue. 
Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. But there's a verse 3 that is also added towards the bottom of our lesson, so I'll read it at this time. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. In other words, they're your brothers and sisters. So apparently, they needed a reminder. This is Paul writing to them. And uh, they tended to become absorbed in their own day-to-day -day activities, sort of like we are today. And they needed this reminder that they are fellow believers and that they should watch out for the other believers. As the church numbers were increasing, the danger of the same condition became more and more uh, prevalent. And for us, with the numbers we have for believers, is even more prevalent. And then entertain strangers. Inns in the inns, like today, we have hotels and we have a lot of accommodations. But in those days, that was not the case. Inns were few and far between. So strangers passing through many times, if they, if there, there was no inn in the area, then they had no accommodations. And really, they depended on the local people help them, helping them out. While we have more accommodations today, hospitality is still needed even in our times. Um, and entertain angels. Well, we have had examples in the Bible of angels that came and surprised. Like we know the story of Lot, when the angels came to actually rescue Lot and his family. And they came and without knowing, Lot did you know, invite them for their own personal safety in his own home and took care of them. And then we have Abraham and Sarah when the angels came to basically deliver the promise. <laughs> what a blessing. I mean, that they entertained them. Imagine if they wouldn't have. I shudder to think of that. And then we have Gideon. And there are other examples in the Bible. But we won't spend a lot of time looking at that. Um, Let's look at the text that follow afterwards, because we think, you know, how important, you know, is it that we provide this hospitality this, that this text tells us? Is it just this one text that tells us so? Romans 12, verses 9 to 13. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, so be diligent about it too, fervent in spirit, with intensity, in, in, uh, be con concerned about it, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. hospitality. Now this part in Romans is really Paul telling what it means to be a Christian. So it is that vital, it's like it's part of the meaning of being a Christian, distributing to the needs, needs of the saints and given to hospitality. But also for leadership is equally important. Timothy 3.21 says, a bishop, meaning a deacon, then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, even the deacon has to be hospitable, able to teach. And then even further, in Titus, we see it's a requirement of an elder. Titus 1.8, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled. This is where they were telling them what would be the requirements to be an elder, to be chosen to be an elder. So we see here that to be a Christian, you have to be hospitable. To be in any form of leadership in the church, you have to have this attribute. It's part of who we are. And uh, we find out that this was not just given to the believers in those days. It's equally important to us in these days. So here we go. How do we know that? From the Bible. First Peter chapter 4, verses 7 to 10. But the end of all things is at hand. It's talking about the end of times. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers, and above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without 
grumbling. So hospitality has to be given with joy and not grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. But faithfulness in ministering to the needs of others uh, will come up for consideration in the final judgment. And that was interesting for me to read. But really, it's a question of that. And here it is in the words of Jesus, Matthew 25, 31 to 36. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, so when? At the second coming. And all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, and he will set the sheep on the, his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. So here we go, visiting those in prison, caring for the needs of strangers. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was hungry, you fed me. So it's in at the second, it's, he's talking to the ones on the right, meaning the ones that have been chosen as his faithful ones. But Jesus gave us a commission to carry this message to others in action. Um, and why? Why did he give us the commission? It's, it's because it's part of who we are, but when he came to this earth, he came with a purpose. He came to the purpose to save us. And likewise, the things that we do are also to save us others. So really, while it may benefit us internally for our change in us, it's really that we are doing this for others. And here we see it in the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. That is our commission too. Great description of our Savior. And Matthew 7:12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. It's not a light like maybe you need to do it. It's part of the law and the prophets. It's significant. There's so much underlining in all these texts of how vital it is that we do this for others. Hebrews 10, 32 to 34. But recall the former days in which, so this is in Hebrews, so we're back to Hebrews. We're studying Hebrews, and it is Paul, and he is talking to the believers. And he says, and the believers mostly that were of Jewish descent in Hebrews that had converted to Christianity. And he says, but recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, in other words, you received the light, endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations because they were being uh, persecuted by other Jewish believer, uh, non-believers. And partly while you became companions of those who were so treated, for you had compassion on me in chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. So here it is the believers, newly um, Jewish believers that had newly become Christians, they didn't mind losing their possessions because many times there was um, things would be confiscated if you were part, like you, if you were friends to uh, someone that was being uh, jailed. So I would like to leave us with the end of verse 3. Remember the prisoners as if in change with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Amen. A day may come to us when we will be mistreated, Amen. and we are part of the body. Now, Mark, Paul warns, warns uh, us against greed and sexual immorality. Yep. Tell us how important this warning is. It's important. I mean, we're talking, discussing, and, and Hebrews discusses brotherly love, and these are two things that will hurt that brotherly love. Mm. You know, and the, and the reality, though, is temptation is, and greed is everywhere. But we're going to learn today, and in this lesson, we're going to learn what 
that by having Jesus in our lives, being content with what we have, and actually we're going to learn that through Jesus, if we're active and actually shrewd, and I'll discuss that, these are ways to combat this temptation of, and greed that are all around us. Let's read uh, Hebrews 13, verses 4 and 5. Um, once again, and, and talk specifically about Hebrews, talks about this idea of sanctity of marriage and, being, and not being covetous. Um, chapter 13, verses 4 and 5. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetous. Be content with the things you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, I was reading the lesson this week, and I was thinking, you know, is, it, is there more temptation today than there was, you know, back then? And, you know, you could maybe, but looking at this, looking at this, the, the verses here, I'd say no. I would say, you know, just like sin, it's been around. And there's a lot of messages that we see in the Bible um, talking about this. I mean, this is Hebrews 13 and 4 and 5 where Paul talks about it. But actually, he wrote a letter to the Corinthians, um, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, which is actually a little harsher language mm -hmm. that talks about these things. Let's, let's read that a second here. It says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs in your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil and desi desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. God will judge, and God is going to judge. And you can see it's pretty harsh there. But you go over to Corinthians, uh, another place. Um, this is Corinthians. Paul wrote a letter to Corinthians, and actually in the congregation there were some pretty bad things happening that he addressed right up. Uh, Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1. It was actually reported that, that, that there is sexual immorality among you, and such immorality that, I, that is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. Mm -hmm. He's actually saying that you, even up against the unbelievers, they wouldn't even think about doing this. And this is happening inside the church. Mm -hmm. So it's around us. So what do we talk about? How do we combat this, this um, way of doing it? And Hebrews brings out, and we're going to read Hebrews 13 and 15, 13 verse 5, and it's pretty straightforward. And, and we'll see what, what Hebrews says. Go back to chapter 13, verse 5, and, and see what it says. And I'm going to jump to the first part. It says, Be content with the things you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So there's this concept of being content. Being content. And what does that mean? And I wanted to kind of dig into that. And, and um, one of the things that it says, and, and Paul brings about this um, in 2 Corinthians 9 and, 10, and 8, 9 and 8, is that whatever you have is enough for you to help glorify the kingdom of God. Let's read what uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8 says. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. That relationship with Jesus and that idea of being well, in contentment, you're going to have everything you need. There's nothing more that you need. You don't need, uh, and, that, and this, this, this is a, becomes a barrier, a, a shield against these temptations and greed. Let's read uh, what uh, very practical quotes from Philippians chapter 4 that Paul talks about how he handles this. This is chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Now that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Be content. Okay, so that's what that's what we talked about. The, but the lesson also brings up Jesus and, and brings up, um, we're going to go jump over to Luke um, in our lesson, and we're going to see what Jesus says about it because he also says a couple other interesting things about the sexual immorality and covetousness. And first I'm going to start out and read specifically what he's saying, very very talking about Hebrews, and we're going to go to Luke verses 16, and we're going to go through 13 and 18 and talk specifically about um, the, the idea here. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he's going to lo be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God 
and mammon. And mammon is worldly possessions. It's in yeah, here. Now the Pharisees, who are lovers of money, had heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourself before man, but God knows your heart, for what is esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophet were until John. Since the time the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressed into it, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one little tittle of the law to fail. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Whoever marries her is divorced from, and who is, who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Okay, so to summarize, God is saying that we, you either love God or love money, okay? And obviously love God. If you are going after something that, that man likes, it's often an abomination in the sight of the God. The law doesn't change. It's, it's going to be there. It's going to be there for it. It's going to be that guidepost for us. And of course, marriage is sacred. But this was happening after. This, these phrases were, came after a parable that he wrote, which is called the parable of the, um, uh, the shrewd manager. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a little bit. I want to dig into this because in this parable, he gives us clues about how to go about dealing with money. And the shrewd manager, I'm going to paraphrase this, and then we'll get to the conclusion. But the, prude, the, the shrewd manager is a master and a money manager. And he is a money manager, and he's going to fire that money manager. Okay? And that money manager, he, he told him, the master told him. So what the money manager did was he had made contracts with those debtors for his master. And he went and he rewrote the contracts for each of those debtors so that the debtors would owe less to the master. And the idea was is that when he got canned, that he could go to those debtors and the debtors would, hey, maybe give him a break, maybe give him a job. And here's an interesting thing what Jesus says in conclusion to this. And this is uh, Luke uh, 16, verses 8. He says, the master commanded, uh, commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. And then he says this, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. So the, this world is the people that are love of money and, and uh, love of money and worldly goods. But he's saying that as people of the light, he wants us to be shrewd. He wants us to be shrewd. Now, how does that deal with? What does that mean with money? And actually, he says it in 9. 10 and 11 of the same, 11 and 12 of the same chapter, and let's read about it. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, though, so that when it is done, you'll be welcome in the eternal dwellings. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful in what is much. He who is unjust in what is least and unjust is what is much. Therefore, if you have, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, gathering of, you know, uh, earthly goods, who will commit to your, you your trust in true riches? If you've not faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? God, Jesus doesn't say throw away money. He doesn't say throw away money. In fact, what he's saying though is he wants us to be faithful in earning it, be honest in earning it, um, help our brother if we're working for someone to earn it, but then he wants us to use it to better his world and to better his, um, his, his kingdom, to spread his message. I want to close with um, what Ellen White says about money. Uh, money has great value because it can do great good. In the hand of God's children is the food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, clothing for the naked. It is a defense for the oppressed and a means to help to the sick. But money is of no value more than sand, only as it is to put us put to use in providing for the necessities of life and blessing others and advancing the cause of Christ. We are going to have, we're going to be tempted. We're going to have, um, we're going to, this idea of being loving money is something that temptation is always going to come up about us. What we can do is have that relationship with Jesus. Be content with what we have today. Understand that he wants us to be active in, in spreading his word and also be shrewd in spreading his word too. In Jesus' name, thanks. Amen. Amen. Thank, thank you so much, Mark. So we, 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 we've seen thus far that hospitality is part of genuine love, pure love. It's, it's part of what God expects us as a family to be. 
We have looked at, at, at a situation where jealousy and greed is really not part of any love whatsoever. And now the Lord tells us on Tuesday's segment of, of, the, of our lesson this week to remember your leaders. Hebrews chapters 13 verses 7 to 17 contains an exhortation to respect and obey the leaders of our congregation. Now I'm just going to concentrate on a couple of verses. So let's read Paul's exhortation to us found in Hebrews uh, chapter 13 verses 7 and 17. So in verse 7 Paul tells us remember those who rule over you who have spoken the word of God to you. Well that tells me already that we are talking about a spiritual environment, a congregation perhaps like us. And then it, it goes on to say, um, who, whose faith you should follow considering the outcome of their conduct. In Hebrews uh, chapter 13 verse 17, Paul goes on to say, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account, lest them do so with joy and not with grief. For that would be unprofitable for you. Great stuff in, this, in these particular verses. So, let me ask you a question. A question. Should Paul's exhortation in Hebrews, verses, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 and 17, the verses we've just read, be applicable to us today? Do we need to, to be submissive? Do we need to, to, to really um, be totally submissive to, to leaders? If so, how should we as members of a worldwide church and a congregation like our congregation in the Laguna Niguel respond to it? Several New Testament books contain important instruction on church leadership. I'm not going to go through through all. But for example, the books of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy and Titus are known as the pastoral epistles because they contain instruction to help leaders regulate the church. Therefore, it should not be surprising that the book of Hebrews also talks about church leadership. And 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Timothy and and, and Titus, as well as Hebrews, were written by Paul. So Paul was concerned about leadership as, uh, as far as church is concerned. In Hebrews chapters 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 7, which was the first verse that we read, church leaders are referred to as those who spoke the word of God to the people. In Paul's time, this is most likely a reference to the missionary evangelists mentioned in chapter 2 of Hebrews, verses 3. So let's read what that verse says. It says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And then he goes on to say, Which had first begun to be spoken by the Lord. So the Lord came and he exposed good news, the gospel to us. And then it says, and was confirmed to us by those who hear him. The missionaries that came along spoke about what they had learned from, from Christ. Today our congregation have a variety of church leaders. Our pastors, elders, like Mark and I, deacons and deaconesses, and of course our ministry leaders. And we've got quite a few in this church. Because of their preaching and teaching, the audience, as Paul states in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, is confronted with the Word of God, which, as it says in that verse, is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. God's Word is like a sharp and double-edged sword that cuts every way. It lays open to us our spiritual condition, it actually shows us as a mirror how we are. It exposes the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. And it let us see our motives. And then 
helps us change them. Let us look again at Hebrews chapters, uh, chapter, verses, uh, chapter 13, verses 7. And, and I would appreciate if we could put this verse up for our audience. I, I want to I wanna unpack this verse a little, a little bit. This, uh, there are three verses that draw attention to these leaders. Three verses. The first verse is remember. And it says, remember those who have spoken the word of God. In other words, don't forget the church leaders in your prayers. Especially those who brought you God's message. The second verb I want to highlight is the verb consider. That verse says, consider the outcome of their conduct. It really says, think back on the good things that they have done. Look at the, the leader's journey and how they have influenced you and, and, and the people that come around. And then the third verb I want you to, to, to pay attention to is either to follow or imitate, depending on the, uh, Bible, um, the Bible you're using, the Bible translation you're using. Those leaders whose faith we should follow is what we should imitate, whose faith is worth to be followed. In other words, it tells us, follow their example. So in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, which is the verse we are unpacking, the Apostle Paul is telling us that we have an obligation to review the course of our leader's efforts and imitate or follow their faithful conduct if it is in line and accord with Scripture and what the Lord has prescribed. Let's look now at the second verse we read at the beginning. That's uh, verses 17 of chapter 13 of Hebrews. This verse also, also makes reference to leadership and how church members should relate to them. Here's what it says. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive to them. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief. For that would be harmful to you. This verse makes it quite clear that the authority of the leadership resides in faithful executing and in faithfully executing the function of their office. And why is that? Because as the verse states, these leaders are keeping watch over our souls. It is just part of their God-given responsibility. When leaders take responsibility seriously, they help their members avoid being carried away by all kinds of strange, strange teaching and the consum uh, consumption of beliefs or information and practices that will not benefit their spiritual growth. Good leaders are aware that leadership demands accountability as illustrated by Jesus in his parable of the faithful servant and the evil servant, which is found in Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 and 51. I don't have time to read that. And finally, as we read in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 17, the second verse we've been unpacking, Paul urges his listeners to obey and submit to their leaders so that their duty can be done with joy and not with grief. So, as an example, Paul recalls the attitude of those followers that showed compassion on individuals that had been arrested and put into prison. And we've already read that verse. Mark did just that. These followers, these Christians, suffered joyfully along with them. They even took, the joy, uh, uh, the, took it joyfully when thieves broke into their homes to steal their belongings. So you see, as Paul explains in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 34, this joy comes from an understanding and belief that what God has prepared for you and for me, for us, in heaven, is far superior than what we will ever have on this earth. So our eyes should be focused on what will be. Such joy is the very reason that Jesus endured the cross 
and disregarded its shame. Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the rain at the right hand of the throne of God. So here's a summary of what Paul is telling you and I in the verses we've read and we've discussed. The combination of care and faithfulness from the leader and obedience and trust from the member will always result in joy. This provides a great opportunity to leaders to serve the congregation with joy. And finally, a successful collaboration between leaders and church members requires mutual trust, respect for one another, and a Christ-like attitude and benevolence. Danielle, Wednesday's lesson tells us to be aware of diverse and strange teachers. Explain, explain that to us. Be aware of diverse and strange teaching. So, of course, we're in Hebrews. And we are looking at Hebrews 13.9. Our lesson for Wednesday is based on that verse. So let's read it first. Do not be carried away with various and strange doctrines. We've heard those kind of warnings before. Mm -hmm. But here we are talking to the converts from Judaism. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. Now for us, it can sound a little strange, but uh, to them it was a warning that they would, for those that would be easily influenced by strange teaching and lacking spiritual discrimination, they would be unable to differentiate between truth and error and comparing the new teaching with scripture. And we have warnings in other parts of the Bible that we are to be discriminate and to review things carefully. We're looking at Ephesians. And Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14 gives us that warning and it says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, like easily swayed, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitfulness, deceitful plotting. So we can see that it, it existed back then and it exists today too. We have all sorts of theories that come our way constantly. And here's another text, Colossians 2. So here it is Paul writing to the Hebrews first to the Jewish people converted to Christianity, then to the Ephesian church, and then to the Colossians. Be aware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit yep. according to the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. So what are the concern as it states in our original Hebrew text, do not be carried about with various strange doctrines that is differing from the pure gospel message uh, that they had already received. And why? For it is good that the heart be established by what the text says? By grace not with foods. So it seems like there was a, uh, some fads kind of ideas coming through the church uh, where they were told that they had to keep certain dietary constrictions or dietary things to, to be saved and that they wouldn't be saved by grace alone. So for some people look at this and they go, okay, uh, from our perspective, we are not Jewish, so we, it's easy for us to misunderstand and not really look at the background. And we look at it and we go, okay, uh, it means that we, should, we could eat anything we want because there's no, not those constraints. But before we rush to that judgment, we see in Acts um, that Acts 15, 19 with 20, let's read it and then we'll review it. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. So, you know, it's like easy for us to read this text in Hebrews and to think that the dietary laws were completely removed. But we can see that they were not completely removed because here we have them in Acts being 
reiterated to the believers. It's just that they didn't have to be constrained by stricter rules that the Jewish people used to maintain. And what are those rules? So it's very easy. Uh, we studied in the pre previous lessons, the, like in lesson number 10, we were looking at the feasts that the Jewish believers had to, uh, the Jewish people had to go to present themselves in Israel in front of God. And there were the feasts of um, unle the, like Passover or Feast of the Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost and the Feast of Booths. There were three times they had to appear. And all those feasts had food uh, rules and restrictions and things that went with them. Uh, and the Jewish believers, when before, like in the Old Covenant, they would keep these. But now that Jesus had come, they were no longer required. But here, just like circumcision came when the Jewish convo converts, some of them were going after the Christians and saying, you have to be circumcised. And Paul said, not true. You're not tied to that anymore. And then they would come to them and say, okay, you have to keep the Passover with all the rules as before. You have to keep uh, the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, and the Feast of Booths. And it was no longer required. Why? Because Jesus had fulfilled those. So it was additional constraints that they were tying people back to those rules of, that there were before in the old covenant that were no longer ruled, rules of requirements in the new covenant. So this is very important to see uh, when we were looking at these, these texts that the, the, the rules and laws that we think of are not what this text is referring to. As a matter of fact, the law, we, we saw that there were still some constraints for food uh, and uh, that they had, we, we saw them in Acts, but we also see in Hebrews chapter 8 verses 10 to 12, quote, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So God's laws are still in existence. The ones that cannot be the immutable ones and they are to be put in our heart. So it's, they have not been done away with. What's been done away with is the old things that used to point towards Christ's sacrifice. So in our lesson then, why is it the idea? The lesson asks a very interesting question. It says, then why is the idea of anything that we do adding to Jesus' sacrifice contrary to the gospel and the grace that is found in Jesus? Basically, clinging to the old festivals with its food rituals and denying the fact that Jesus was the completion of those festivals, it was rejecting Jesus' sacrifice. And I want to close with just Jesus' words himself. In John chapter 6, verses 47 to 58, and here we go. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give in my flesh is my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So basically he's saying, and continuing in verse 58, This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. So the idea is we cannot go back to the old covenant festivals, they're not required. I mean, they can be traditions that we enjoy, but they're not a religious requirement. Jesus was the complete fulfillment of those festivals. Amen. Amen. Christ truly is um, our, our life. We need to internalize it with the Holy Spirit as, as he provides us the Holy Spirit. We will be desperately keenly to do what Paul says, I want to die for self. Mm 
so that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And that's really, Amen. really it. You, you know, Mark, Thursday's lesson has an incredible title. It's Go to title. Jesus outside the camp. Yeah. And I, I just, you, you know, what, what does that mean? Yeah, just what does that mean? It. So the, um, actually, I was thinking of my house. I was thinking, where in my house, um, and you guys probably know this, the ones, the inside joke, is where in my house do we put all the junk? That's right. <laughs> well, there's probably two places in most houses. One is maybe the attic, but in my house, it's the garage. It just happens to be where I spend most of my time, by the way, because of this uh, COVID situation. But what the title is, Go to Jesus Outside the Camp. And the idea is that the place outside of the gate is actually the most unpure in the whole camp. And this has been through uh, Moses and through even at the time of Jesus, this is it. The carcasses of the sacrificial animals were burned outside there. We read in Leviticus uh, chapter 4, verses 12, it says that the whole bull he shall carry outside the camp to a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burned it on a wood with fire where the ashes are poured out, it shall be burned. Outside the camp is also where the lepers needed to go. It says right here in Leviticus 4, verses 46, he shall be unclean. All the days he has the sore, he shall be unclean. He is unclean and shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Blasphemers and criminals were executed outside the camp. Let's read in Leviticus 24 a story here on verses 10 through 16. Now the son of an Israelite woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel, and this Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought each other in the camp. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. So they brought him to Moses. His mother's name, her, uh, his mother's name was Shelemith and daughter of Nebri of the tide of Dan, tribe of Dan. And they put him in custody that in the mind of the Lord might be shown to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take outside the camp him who is cursed, who has cursed and let all who who heard him lay their hands on his head and let the congregation stone him. Then you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, Whoever curses the God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemies the Lord, the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall be certainly stoned. The stranger as well as him who is born in the land, and he blasphemies the name of the Lord, and he shall be put to death. It's interesting because this is pretty much exactly the time of Jesus the excuses that the Pharisees had on this trumped up charges on Jesus. Absolutely. If you read in, in Mark verses 14 verses 63 and 64, then the high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Blasphemy, death. Of course, that was of course false. Now, where did, they, where did Jesus get crucified? He didn't get crucified inside the city. He got crucified outside in a place called, let's read this in chapter 19, verses 17 and 20. He and he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. And they crucified him and two others with him, one on one side and Jesus in the center. And now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And many of the Jews read the title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, outside, but near. And it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. So let's jump back into Hebrew and, and Hebrews. And actually, Jesus, it, he, what Paul is saying in Hebrews is he wants us to go outside the camp. Interesting. Well, of course, we know what's outside the camp. Jesus is. Let's read in Hebrews 13, verses 10 through 14. We have an altar for which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat for the bodies of those animals whose blood was brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifices of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, give thanks to his name. Amen. Hebrews is saying, hey, let's go outside. But you know, I think it also is saying, 
let us, and we're going to read a few other verses, be prepared to be uncomfortable. It may not always be, you know, it's, it's outside the camp. There's dangers there. Sometimes there's difficulty there. Um, but it is how we come to know Jesus. In Mark 8, verses 34 and 35, this is Jesus' own words. He says, And when he called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. He wants us to carry the cross with him, to follow him outside that gate. You know, this is not the first time we've seen that going outside of the camp is where God is located. Um, we also see this in Exodus, um, time of Moses, uh, during the during the, con the, gate, the, golden, the great golden calf controversy where Moses pitches to God's tent outside the camp and had them follow. And this is Exodus 13, 33, verses 7. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, called it the tabernacle of meeting. And, they, and it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So we're going to need, Jesus says, come meet me outside the camp. Pick up your cross, follow me. But that's exactly what we want. Victor's been talking about it. Daniel's been talking about it. We, he wants us that relationship with Jesus. He is, and, and this is Hebrews, we're going to read into Hebrews 12 verses 2, a wonderful quote. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus, this is chapter two, 12 verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, for who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, when we do this journey with Jesus, we may be humiliated at times. Mm -hmm just like Jesus was. We may, it may be, you know, um, it may be shameful times, you know, or something, difficult issues. Um, it may not be pleasant all the time. But in Hebrews, it also tells us this, but it will be momentary compared to what we will get. Look at this in Hebrews 12, verses 11. Now no chastising seems to be joyful for the present, but painful nevertheless. Afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. Amen. You know, I want to close by saying, you know, that, you know, this cross that, that he's come and asked us to, to bear, to, you know, as we preach God's word, as we go around and we talk about Jesus, you know, it may not always be easy. But I'll tell you, Jesus and Matthew, I, I love this quote from Matthew chapter 11, yeah, it's going to be easy. This yoke that he's asked us to carry will be easy. It's, uh, let's read it. Come to me, all you, you who labor and are heavy burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you very much. Thanks yep. so much, Mark. Sure. Danielle, any final thoughts from you? Yes, so there is a current among today's Christian church to reach out and uh, bring back the festivals. We've had friends that have told us you need to do the Passover and you need to do the Feast of Weeks and you need to do the Feast of Trumpets. Um, um, you just should do it. Or even sometimes to add newly minted new rules and things that we need to add on and start keeping and doing that weren't even done in the past. Um, but we are told in the Word of God that we are not to be swayed uh, this way or that way with these uh, old or new uh, festivals or things to do because Jesus was the complete sacrifice and he, we are to follow his directives in the New Testament and we are to divide any of these things that come our way with the word of God go back to the word of God anytime we are questioning whether we are to do one thing or another we're not to be swayed and then in closing thoughts, uh, as Christ followers, we have a commandment, and yes, it is a commandment to care for others, um, to minister to those mistreated uh, in various avenues of life, and to provide hospitality. Uh, and we have an invitation for each one of us to uh, do that and 
we just need to ask the Lord to open our eyes and to open the way and direct us where someone is in need. And he will provide. If we sincerely open our hearts and ask him for that, he will show us the way uh, of who to help. Prayer is very important. We've been admonished through the word of God to pray. But these texts that we started today are texts inviting us to action and commanding us to action. Jesus was all about ministering to others. And so are we as his followers. Thanks so much. You know, uh, we've been talking about brotherly love, and two of the things that we talked about that really can hurt, hurt brotherly love, of course, is sexual immorality and greed. But by what we learned just short, simply, I wanted to conclude that, you know, by following Jesus, um, it helps to shield us around that and help shield others. Be content with what you have at any particular moment. There will be something you want, but be content with what you have. And then also be active in your pursuits of your job, your responsibility. These are stepping stones and that can be used shrewdly so that you can, you know, spread God's message, that you can use it to help put the, the idea of God is somewhere else and, and help to increase that brotherly love. Thank you. Man, thanks so much, uh, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. I, I really want to... Um, uh, provide some final thoughts and appeal, and I'm, I'm really going to go through the scriptures and to the spirit of prophecy, because I, I think uh, that not only does God speak eloquently, but um, Ellen White, uh, and I've got three paragraphs that I want to share with you, has um, eloquently expressed what it is like to love one another. And so let, let me go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to 11. I, I just love this, this passage of Scripture. Um, I love this, uh, this book intensely. And here's how John puts it. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. That in itself is just a major statement. And then he goes on to say, and everyone who loves is born of God and loves God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. Verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. So my life is not worthy of anything unless... I can live through Christ. And then in verse 10, 10 says, In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loves us and sent His Son to be the propitiation of our sins. And in verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, what an appeal He's going to make. We also ought to love one another. Here's what the Ellen G. White says. The first of the paragraphs is found in First testimonies uh, in testimonies for the church volume 8 and page 242 and she tells us and uh, and this is perhaps not a very good picture but she, she encourages later in the church of God she says today <coughs> brotherly love is greatly lacking many of those who profess to love the Savior neglect to love those who are united with them in Christian fellowship. We are of the same family, members of one family, all children of the same heavenly Father, with the same blessed hope of immortality. How close and tender should be the tie that bonds us together, she asks. The people of the world are watching us to see if our faith is in exerting a sanctifier influence in our hearts. Let us give them no occasion to reproach our faith. This is the challenge. This is the call. Then Ellen, Ellen White, in um, uh, writing for the January 13, uh, 1898 issue of Youth's Instructor, makes the following observation. Pure love is simply in its operations and separate from every other principle of action. 
It's, it's simple. Pure love is simple. When combined with earthly motives and selfish interests, it ceases to be pure. God considers more God, um, God considers more with how much love we work than the amount we do. Love is a heavenly attribute. The natural heart cannot originate it. This heavenly plant only flourish where Christ reigns supreme. Where love exists, there is power and truth in life. Love does not Love does good and nothing but good. Those who have love bear fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Love is pure. Love is of God. Without God, there is no love. And then the third paragraph, the final paragraph, found in Test Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 135, Ellen White writes, <laughs> Love cannot live without action. And every act increases, strength, strengthens, and extends it. Love will gain the victory when arguments and authority are powerless. Love works not for profit nor reward. Yet God has ordained that great gain shall be the certain result of every labor of love great gain. It is melting and transforming in its influence. We're talking about love. And will take hold of the lives of the sinful and affect their hearts when every other means have proved unsuccessful. Love one another for God so loved you. Love as God loved. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for your amazing, amazing grace. Lord, this week we have been encouraged to let brotherly love continue until you come into eternity. We've learned that love is from you. Love is part of your existence in us. And so, Father, I pray, help us die for self. For if self reigns selfishness and jealousy and greed and malice is the result. Help us die for self, O oh Lord. And as we die for self, take our will and mold it into yours so that we truly become bond servants. We truly become an extension of heaven on earth. And by being that extension, not only do we exercise your love in us as we die for self as you live in us, and therefore we will be able to have this brotherly love, this Philadelphia, continuously. But Lord, we will be able to shine, to shine your character, to shine your love, to shine your truth to, uh, to those around us until you come. I want to thank you for, for, for the book of Hebrews. I want to thank you the message that we studied for the last 13 weeks. And Lord, I appeal to you. Help us, help us not only to learn it and to understand it, but live it every day. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.